start off with, I'll ask a question to you, Matt, as so I guess it's your department. For those who aren't too aware of, I guess, what the PSP is, or so the PSP is after Wogel and Drew, and could you just give a quick one minute overview of exactly what they involve and what they, what they try to do? I guess the precinct structure plans or PSPs are a second stage to a, a larger strategic um, direction for the municipality. So uh, the organisation started off with its settlement strategy, which draws a boundary around our townships of where urban growth can extend to before you hit to um, our, our farming areas or our more sensitive locations. The PSP itself sits um, over the top of that and provides I guess the, the skeleton um, of where roads, parks and some of that more high level um, infrastructure needs to be located so that as the uh, municipality and the two townships particularly of uh, Warrigal and Druin expand, we have greater certainty about where roads should be, collector roads, where parks should be located, where some of the major drainage uh, components are in public open space areas. It's a, it's a uh, document to provide that guidance but it's not actually set in concrete it's always subject to I guess refinement as we go through to the next stage that follows a, the adoption of a, a precinct structure plan which is the individual subdivision applications which then drill down to the actual detail of local roads local drainage networks and the like. Now you mentioned how concrete uh, this is not necessarily a concrete plan but when and Murray you've been frustrated by some interpretations of the plan as being I guess this is exactly what's going to happen but isn't it fair that people would see the council's long-term plan if the council puts in your house will be removed or would, should, would, would like would like your house to be removed so that this recreation area can come in or something like that wouldn't it be fair for people to think that yes that is what's going to happen in the long-term plan given it is in the council's long-term plan it's important to realise that the landowner is definitely in the driver's seat. It's their house. They live in it as long as they want to. It's their choice as to what happens to that house into the future. It'll probably get to the stage where the value of the land uh, dictates in their interest that they make a move, but it's their call. But with, but with this plan in place, is there some concern, I guess, also uh, with the uh, house valuations as well? I mean, if it starts to have... If these things come up on plans as... as possible for demolition, wouldn't it, wouldn't it make it difficult for house or landholders to resell their land if they plan to before, before the PSP, I guess, reaches its time for introduction? The thing is that um, the, the plan is just a guide and uh, as Matthew said, that, that the next stage for the uh, planning permit application, there will be some horse trading between developers. The problem we've got now is individual developers are doing development in isolation. What we've done is looked at the bigger picture of Druin and Warrigal as a whole and looked at linkages and where we do need some certain infrastructure but there's room for movement and that will happen into the future. Who knows what will happen in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, local government is a creature of state government. Look at the green wedges around Melbourne where legislation has changed things as time goes on. And I imagine the same thing will happen here. What we're doing is a starting point as a guide, setting some uh, reasonable certainty into the future rather than doing ad hoc planning. So I guess um, what have been, I guess, the... Um, how, how should this plan be interpreted then in terms of, I guess, the pri its priorities and how have people misinterpreted or what have been the... what have people got wrong about, about the plan then? Well, I think the main thing they've got wrong is um, thinking that the whole thing is etched in stone and there won't be changes. And um, also the fact that uh, they haven't got control over their own land. And um, as I explained previously, they definitely have. Sorry, Matthew, I was just going to add, the other thing that I think has been a misconception is at the moment we're consulting with the public. The council hasn't decided on the, the end result of the plan. We've gone out to the community to ask them questions about uh, what has been put down at this point in time and we're receiving that feedback so that a lot of the comments which may be around um, location of parks which is one of the key issues um, also a question about what will happen to people's properties as time evolves are things which uh, I guess can be refined um, need to be clarified which is part of this consultation process we've been working through now you're in you're still in that consultation process at the moment and I think um, you're making a decision later this this week um, as to whether or not to adopt the plan um, of course people watching will 
be aware that that's this this week is now two weeks ago I think because this is um one the wonders of publication um, but I guess the consultation period seems was extended though because of I guess suddenly a whole raft of people in the group so a raft of people who would be affected by this found out relatively close to the date that it was to be decided on um, has the do you feel the consultation had been enough because you did have to extend it this consultation period yeah, I've been led by Matthew and his experience in this particular area dealing with other similar consultation processes but uh, the feedback we got was that um, um, there needed to be a, a closer look at some of these situations and we just allowed ourselves some more time to do that. Um, consultation meant that um, yes there were some concerns so we paid those concerns the interest they deserved. Mm. But the, um, the original time period you feel you, you did have to extend it, do you feel that you've now had uh, enough time I guess to get the community's full view before making this decision? I guess just to, to clarify slightly we didn't necessarily extend the consultation period so the consultation period officially uh, started I think it was on the 18th of June and ran for four weeks or so just over to the 18th of July um, which allowed submissions to be made. The council determined that they wouldn't uh, determine its position on the submissions made um, for uh, for an extra couple of weeks. So originally we were proposing to go and uh, discuss this with council on the 23rd, I think it was, yes. of uh, July. Uh, the councillors and ourselves as officers had a discussion and decided no to give uh, enough uh, time to consider all of the submissions, which is a total, I think, of 216, um, that we just needed additional time uh, so that we could hear from the submitters through uh, a, a public meeting and then lastly to then uh, refine our, our views and uh, from an officer perspective so that I can put it to council uh, on the 6th of August. Now still on consultation there were a number of people who um, uh, looked at this document and said oh there's my property listed there, there's something about my property. I wasn't aware of that. Why were people who were directly mentioned in the document um, including a, one local farmer who didn't know until they found uh, mentioned that their farm might, might have to be removed why were these people not informed, I guess, um, so they could have their submissions heard, given that it was their land that was being directly mentioned in, 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 in the plan? Well, letters were sent out, and, and uh, Matthew will be able to explain exactly how that took place. Yeah, so, as part of our consultation process, we did uh, directly um, send out mail to, I think it was about 1,200 um, properties that were impacted directly by the plan as well as uh, people abutting the the boundaries between the residential existing residential areas and the future expansion um, of the uh, the growth areas uh, in addition to that there were a number of uh, adverts placed in and uh, public notices placed in uh, our local papers as well as uh, we undertook a number of meetings um, which ran during the day and in the evening to enable those people who we had notified or people who had read about it um, the opportunity to come and talk to officers. The consultation that we provided, we believe, and in discussions with the um, Metropolitan Planning Authority is well and truly above what would normally occur in a lot of these situations. So we're, we're confident that what we've undertaken is quite an extensive um, process of consulting and letting everyone know. You can't always um, control what people take from a letter they receive. Uh, you, can, uh, you can provide the information, but if they don't read it, it's uh, sometimes a difficult scenario. Um, then the other part of it is this is a second um, component. The, the precinct structure plan is the second um, step in this planning process. As I talked earlier, we have undertaken a settlement strategy which um, has gone through a very extensive um, process which uh, a number of properties um, which are now raising concerns about the impact on their own land holdings were well aware of. So they've been taken on a journey. So it's whether they haven't understood what the potential relocation of a growth boundary might be or the, the, um, the township boundary, not understanding uh, the detail may have um, created this uh, misconception or panic or concern about uh, what has been presented by council's uh, planning team uh, to the community. So, so people like that, that, like the farmer in question, would you say would have received notification in in the mail that their house or the, their, their farm land would have been affected? They received a letter, yes, saying that we were going through this process, and they received a, uh, a flyer um, or information uh, sheet. It didn't necessarily specifically say your land is being rezoned um, or your land is now. Um, you know, 
is being identified for this purpose, um, but it did provide details of what the intent was of that area in uh, a schematic form, enabling the uh, the owner uh, to obviously ask the question of council and make a submission, which they have done to um, as well to council about the uh, the plan itself. And really, until council this Wednesday night decides on uh, what will get up. Um, no one has been in a position to say exactly to anyone exactly what's going on. All we could do was identify that their land was in a certain area that was being considered. The other thing I'd bring out is that um, community engagement is a concern Council has generally. We try so hard across so many different topics to engage the community, to find out what they want, uh, to, to um, tell them what's happening. Most people are time poor, they're very busy, and uh, pick and choose what they uh, um, take on board. And, and we've got no control of that. But we are trying very uh, hard to use different forms of the media to reach our community to find out firstly what they want, and then secondly, uh, give them feedback as to what direction council wants to go. Now, the a lot, another criticism of the, of, of the PSPs was the involvement of the Metropolitan Planning Authority. Although they have a lot of experience in the area, people see Melbourne on it and they think, oh, it's not been designed locally. How much of this was planned by the MPA and how much was done by local planners? Well, it was actually a partnership. Um, the Metropolitan Planning Authority has obviously a significant amount of experience in uh, looking at uh, precinct structure plans and they've provided their uh, in-depth knowledge to assist our planners look at the, the key, um, I guess, ways that a plan should be developed. However, there has been a significant focus in relation to ensuring characteristics and our, our regional characteristics, which is very different to that of your expanding suburbs. And we often hear about Pakenham and uh, other uh, suburbs which uh, our local community don't see as desirable. Um, so there's been a significant amount of local content uh, embedded into our precinct structure plan design guidelines to ensure that we respect the characteristics of our, our local uh, community and our local um, urban environment. So yes, the MPA have been a, a significant um, partner in this process, but there has been, as, as I say, it has been a partnership between our planning officers and the Metropolitan Planning Authority to uh, develop up the documentation that we currently have in front of us. The other thing is too that uh, Balboa is a part of a peri-urban group of um, six other municipalities at Ring Melbourne and those other municipalities are pretty keen to have access to this same help from the MPA that we've had. They see it um, as very professional and they also see it as cost saving too because um, if uh, we hadn't had the help of the MPA we probably would have had to employ some consultants to do this uh, high, high level work. Now, my, the council is obviously going to be the people making the decision on this. Are all councillors, as far as uh, I guess, united in terms of what they feel about this plan, or are, is, are there some divisions in the group as to as to what? <laughs> this is an interesting question to ask. Down, so I know, um, are there some divisions, I guess, as, as to the the focus and the plans for for this for this? Yeah. As with all um, questions that come before a council. Until you have hands in the air, those nine hands go up, it is very difficult to find out exactly what's going on. None nonetheless, this council has a habit of making quite a few decisions, behind, um, well, uh, you'd argue otherwise, but there's a lot of discussion that goes on before the council meetings for people to, I guess, to try and get as you become as unanimous as possible before the meeting, so you would have an idea of how yes. most other councils feel. I'm talking about the information gathering phase, and yes, you know, that is a very much a shared time. We bounce off each other. Uh, talk about different ideas and whatever, but we are definitely uh, nine individuals with minds of our own and uh, I'm looking forward to the debate on Wednesday night and we have to go to that debate with an open mind. Some people during a debate will change their mind because someone comes up with a good argument that they haven't thought of and that's what debating is all about. Um, now another example of another, I guess, complaint about the plan would be the Lilico, houses in the Lilico area with um, the recreation reserves I think put in, and a, cu a couple of new zones placed over houses when they would be better placed I guess a few meters away from where the houses are. How, how, did, how did those plans, that, how did those zones end up covering those houses in the first place when it, it seems a pretty basic operation to move them 15 meters over into a land that hasn't necessarily been earmarked by the PSP? 
Yep. I might uh, take that one for you. <laughs> uh, so from a planning perspective, the starting point for the growth areas is to almost consider it as a blank canvas. Let's uh, look at the topography, look at the, um, the natural environment, look at where the water features are, and then... But even considering the topography, there's some areas that are arguably flatter for a sporting area to go to unless it's a drainage issue. There are a number of issues in terms of topography but in terms of working through our our consideration we've considered it without um, having any real consideration for the detail of lot boundaries um, or where potential buildings are. It's really looking at the general principles um, which have been based around best location for um, certain type of uses and certain type of activities. The other thing with uh, parks and uh, reserves, we've also looked at what the, uh, the catchment of those parks might be. And um, we've also looked at other principles like uh, locating our parks near uh, the growth boundary um, boundary itself so that we get the merge between our farming areas back with the, the park so it's not this hard line of back fences onto a, a, a farming property for instance. So there's been a number of principles which have been used to consider where we would locate it. That's why we go through the consultation phase. We've received feedback about the, the concern that some of the parks are located over um, properties where houses are, are situated, and we're working through um, the feedback we've received to determine whether the park can be relocated, should be relocated, and if so, uh, where and, and how that would occur. Mm. Um, now, I guess, finally, um, both, for both of you, I guess, what, what do you hope the final resolution for this will be? I guess, what the, the, um, the obviously you know, you'd both like it to pass, but I mean in terms of the, the, vi the vision of this plan, I guess, what, what are you hoping to achieve with this? The state government has said this is a growth corridor and it's the state government to make the rules whereby that local government um, operate by. On behalf of our community, we will work very hard to come up with the best plan to accommodate the uh, residents that come here. We will lobby government strongly for the infrastructure that comes here. And the other thing that we haven't mentioned was instead of looking at individual uh, developers doing small areas, we've looked at the whole of Warrigal, the whole of Druin, to try and get the linkages, the, the open areas, and, and design it for a complete community. And we're doing that on behalf of the community to try and make it as livable as possible. And and I guess from a, from a planning perspective, a lot of uh, what Councillor Cook has touched on is um, really the backbone for the document. This has a, been a strategic uh, piece of work starting back in 2006 where uh, we've had both uh, state government policy, uh, our regional policy um, and growth plan identify Warrigal and Druin as, as a location for peri-urban growth. We've undertaken the work in terms of our settlement strategy and now the PSP to try and ensure that we have the best ability for future growth within our, our two townships to make sure that it has minimal impact on, um, on, I guess, the wider area. We have the ability to integrate these new communities with the old communities and ensure that we've got fantastic infrastructure that uh, will support both the new communities and some of that our existing communities will be able to utilise as well so that we have a, a well-balanced, um, I guess, uh, future um, growth and expansion of our, our two towns, uh, which will be, I guess, welcomed by as many, or the majority, or as many people as we possibly can. And now, actually, finally, this time, <laughs> the um, other towns that aren't Warrigal and Drew in the area, we're obviously looking at this as a plan for the big two. What other planning things are planned? Planning things. Planning. <laughs> what other what other planning projects are planned for those areas coming up? Well, we've all, well, the settlement management plan looked at the 19 settlements within our shire, and uh, you know we've looked at the boundaries of those shires. But when you take into overlays that relate to uh, catchment, uh, fire, uh, flood, uh, slippage, etc. And once you get away from the uh, spine of the highway and the railway line, um, you get public transport problems. So, um, and the other thing, of course, is Trafalgar, Yarrigan and Long Warri have drainage problems. So these all things were identified and taken into the mix when we were looking at those towns in relation to residential development. And again, it came back to Druin and Warrigal, and that, that's where the uh, PSP um, aspects come into it. So, so you're trying to focus growth to these towns rather than the towns that the issues you mentioned? All towns were looked at, but there were limitations mm. to some of the other towns. So that, that settlement strategy that uh, Council refers to sets a, a new expanded boundary for growth, mm. but it is uh, governed significantly by the constraints that those uh, 
environmental um, or the environmental constraints place on those townships themselves. So it's interesting. I think too, we're t we're having to deal with the growth that um, is coming here. Um, there hasn't been a con consultation with the wider Australian community. Do they want to grow the population of Australia to 40 million, whatever? Um, and yet, um, as local government, we have to deal with the consequence of what's happening with the, the bigger picture. Thank you very much. Thank you.